so let's go straight into it then. Um, uh, where we are, how we got here, and how we can move on. You know the usual sort of stuff about the book and the Dave Cushman's website. Uh, Dave Cushman's website is uh, probably a bit more important because um, there's a lot of information on it. It's relevant to what we've been uh, talking about the last few weeks. <coughs> so a few general comments. Um, I'd like to thank the Warm Up Act so far because they've given me the material that I'm going to try and put into some sort of form um, that beekeepers can use. Um, won't be um, uh, too much tonight on those um, uh, on those lines, but um, uh, there will be in the following two webinars. So I'm making use of, in, in my three webinars, I'm making use of what other speakers have said. I'm going to try and do it in a logical sequence uh, too, uh, which isn't going to be uh, particularly easy, but I'll, I'll do my best. A lot of what I'm telling you is um, either personal experience um, with a little bit of uh, opinion, and I have had to excuse me, I have had to refer to uh, the sci scientific information in one or two uh, areas. Although, as most of you know, I do usually try and keep to my own experiences if I can. Uh, if I give any uh, examples, which I will, uh, they're absolutely genuine, uh, but I'll try not to identify anyone, uh, good or bad, because I, I do get invited to a lot of um, beekeeping associations and apries and that sort of thing and I want to feel that I can um, I can still be um, uh, welcome. <clears throat> I don't rubbish things um, if, if possible. What I try to do is um, to chat through things with people and then try and persuade them if I think there's a there's an alternative to um, uh, uh, to what they're doing. I try to keep, keep away from uh, politics, and I'm afraid in beekeeping there's an awful lot. And um, uh, one of the things you may come across if you go back to your local beekeeping association is that um, people have got their, their heads in the sand and they don't really want to change. Um, uh, you know, you get the political situations there. Uh, and I have um, uh, absolutely no commercial interests uh, at all. I really want the best for our bees and our beekeepers, and that's what I strive for uh, all the time. I hope you folk do uh, too. <clears throat> so where we are? Well, it does actually vary considerably um, with, with uh, your location. Um, and it can vary from the areas where there are actually pure native bees. <clears throat> Absolutely no question uh, about that. In those areas that I go to, what I find is that the, they're, all the bees are usually fairly similar. So they've got a set, similar sort of um, colony characteristics. They behave the same or similar when you're uh, inspecting them and that sort of thing. Uh, usually it's in areas where there's a harsh climate and not much else will survive. Um, clearly they've got to suit the locality. So they're hardy and they're going to be survivors. They've got to. <clears throat> Um, and then we go to the other extreme, um, areas of heavy mongrelization, where there really is a variable um, percentage of uh, genes, many exotic ones, often very, very mixed uh, too. That, of course, gives variable characteristics, often in the same apiary too. So perhaps if somebody um, takes in swarms or something like that, um, you can you can go through a, a, a or I can go through a row of ten or a dozen fifteen hives, and, I, and they're all very very different. And I guess it's something that the uh, bee inspectors uh, often see um, when they're doing the ins their inspections too. <laughs> if you've got colonies like that, uh, if you raise queens from them, uh, you tend to get unreliable daughter queens. They don't breed uh, true. So you get lots of variation, um, behavior, um, temper, prolificacy, um, all those uh, are sort of things. Sometimes it means that the management methods um, that are needed, they vary too, because take perhaps prolificacy. Um, some bees you, you can um, uh, run on a single brew chamber. Others, uh, perhaps double brood chamber, you, mu you must have. Others you can work on a brood and a half. All sorts of things like that. <coughs> it's probably aggravated um, 
by continual importation. It's certainly, I see uh, more problems in areas where there's, there's no importations. Um, in areas like that, there's probably little hope of improvement if we carry on as we are, but if we do something, uh, then we can probably, um, uh, we can probably improve things. You know, overall, in those sort of areas, it really is um, a, quite a mess. And I've known of some very, very good beekeepers just completely give up trying to improve their bees because of um, something coming in from outside. Could be 15 or 20 colonies dumped down by a commercial beekeeper of a different kind, and it just wrecks what somebody's doing. Now, these um, mongrels can actually be improved. So please don't give up. Um, there are way, ways around it, which I hope we're going to be able to tell you in the next few weeks. Uh, imports then, um, what's the problems with them? Well, they may not suit the location. Um, they're usually very prolific. Um, that could end up with starvation summer and winter. When I started keeping bees, uh, starvation was only a winter problem. Now it's a summer problem too. And a, a lot of them, I'm afraid, simply aren't very tough. But whatever the state is, their drones are available during the uh, summer. Okay, the colony might die out of the winter, but during the summer, the drones are there. Um, they're mating with the local queens. Uh, they're helping to dilute the population. Again, adding to the uh, in local instability <coughs> and possible aggression in subsequent generations. Now, this aggression I will deal with um, a little bit later on, but it... it is quite quite an issue so what happens when people get aggressive um uh, uh, bees uh they simply go and buy some more where from exactly the same place um for the same thing uh, to happen again so you end up with a vicious circle and uh that then ends up being as basically just a short-term fix which of course is unsustainable and unsustainable is another word that i'll use several times and is becoming, um, well, I won't say fashionable, but it's, it's certainly being used a lot more than it used to be. Little in, uh, history about uh, air importations <coughs> from what I can glean from various sources. It appears that the first recorded importation was in 1859. But uh, a couple of years ago, I spoke to somebody who is in the know, and he claimed that um, there are records, or he found records, um, of importations about 20, 20 so years before that. Um, I've never been able to verify that, but 1859 is the one that all, we, we all know about. Over the years, there have been spikes of heavy, heavier importation. Um, of course, one of them was the Isle of Wight disease, <coughs> when even the government um, uh, got involved. Um, so it was a disease, it wasn't really a disease, but let's, um, let's not deal with that today. And weather related as to uh, two. Um, and the first first um, year I can remember was uh, straight after 1962-63 winter, um, when a lot of uh, bees died. Uh, if you look at past literature, uh, between the two world wars, um, there was a massive amount of advertising uh, for queens and uh, bees. They were mainly Italian. You look at them. And they were either publicising or advertising leather colour coloured or golden. And there are seen to be two types of uh, Italian, which I will uh, discuss a little bit later. <coughs> there were some rather wild claims, certainly uh, claims that you wouldn't get away with these days without ending up in trouble. And of course, um, a lot of discrediting uh, other types. But of course, if you've got something that you want to sell, uh, one of the best ways of selling it is saying that everybody, what everyone else has got is rubbish. So what have imports achieved then? Uh, again, this is my opinion. Quite frankly, I think it's completely wrecked the indigenous uh, population. Okay, I wasn't um, uh, 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 a witness to what was there at the time. Uh, but bearing in mind it lasted 10,000 years, we've been here 10,000 years um, without intervention. Um, tends to suggest that, that 
so there wasn't too much wrong with them. Um, they've achieved a, basically an unstable population in a lot of areas. And as I've already mentioned, they may not breed true. So if you've got a decent colony with a decent queen, if say you take half a dozen queen cells from that uh, colony, you could well end up uh, with half a dozen different, uh, uh, different kinds of bees. There's um, certainly reduced survivability um, because um, as I'll explain uh, later, they simply, um, a lot of imports simply don't um, uh, survive in the wild, but also in marginal areas uh, uh, too, where they, um, uh, where they simply just don't, don't survive. Um, you know, um, uh, areas where it's uh, uh, pretty cold during the winter. <coughs> Introduction, um, sorry, importation has also introduced uh, pests, diseases and pathogens, one of which of course is Varroa, which um, I'm long enough in the tooth to know that it completely changed beekeeping forever. Um, it's nowhere near the joy that it, uh, it, it used to be. Many beekeepers now have come in since, since Varroa and don't know any different, but it, you, you could do all sorts of things with colony of bees 30, 40 years ago. <clears throat> What it's also done is encourage poor advice and information because a lot of the information that's given uh, now is really relevant to uh, the imports, such as um, you, uh, you must have a queen that lays a lot of eggs, very prolific. Uh, you must have big colonies to produce um, a crop of honey, all that sort of thing, which actually isn't necessary, but it's just become part of um, normal mainstream teaching now. And of course, unsustainability again, because um, uh, you people buy a queen, uh, the daughter then gets mated with something else. You've got something different, and to carry on with what you already had, really you've got to bring some more in, which of course are Im imported. It's also made a money for money for quite a few people uh, too over the years, but what's it done for the rest of us? Got us absolutely nowhere. How long's it taken to do it? century and a half and we got nowhere so how we got here then <clears throat> well despite what a lot of beekeepers think and i mean a lot of beekeepers honey bees are not all the same they can be very different um the different characteristics different behavior visually etc but many beekeepers really don't know why despite it being in uh, quite a lot of uh, books uh, I'm giving you some reasons, but of course they're not all. There's natural reasons. Um, there are about 28 subspecies. I say about because um, I don't think even the scientists can agree. Um, we've got Adam Tafilski um, speaking in three or four weeks, and um, uh, he talks about 30 subspecies. I've also heard as low as 26. I suspect what it is that some people think that um, uh, they're a variation on another one. Others think they're a different uh, subspecies, but around about 28 um, uh, plus or minus two. Within that, there's natural variation, call it ecotypes uh, if you like. <laughs> and then of course, there's the human involvement. And whenever you get humans involved, there's usually problems down the line. Moving stock, of course, is one of them which firstly causes hybridization. And secondly, um, the next generation, of course, uh, mongrelization, and then you end up basically with what we've, what we've got. We've also got people importing uh, queens and then raising them uh, here as uh, British raised or, or whatever. What is natural? <clears throat> um, so let's have a look at uh, what may have happened. I say may because, um, again, we're relying on the scientists. So the evolution of bees, what we, what, what we think is, um, is the route that was taken. There's obviously some conjecture because um, as much as anything, fossil records are pretty sparse. But it's fairly certain that the Western honeybee, which is our honeybee, um, found its way to Africa some way. Whether they actually started there or they moved from the Near East, which some think, um, 
I don't know. It really doesn't matter. They found their way to Africa somehow. And like all expanding species, um, they spread in different directions. And in doing so, uh, they formed uh, four major main branches, uh, two minor branches, um, which are known as evolutionary lineages, depending on which route they took out of uh, Africa. Um, the scientists call them uh, lineages uh, A, C, M, and O, and Y and Z being the uh, being the minor ones. <coughs> we in our islands are really probably only concerned with C and M. When they uh, uh, dispersed, uh, they became isolated by natural barriers, which perhaps could have been uh, sand or water or mountain ranges. And it was there they developed into the subspecies that we uh, know today and took on the characteristics to um, to suit the environment that they found themselves in. Now, one of the definitions of a subspecies is that they can all uh, interbreed. And of course, that's what they've done, um, mainly through being shunted around by uh, us humans. <coughs> this is a well-known uh, map um, from uh, Dorian Pritchard. The colors really represent the temperature ranges. So you've got really got to look at the black lines rather than the colors. Um, but Italian bees, which are probably the, the uh, most used, most popular in the world, um, they evolved in that little uh, area there, bordered by the Mediterranean um, and, the, uh, uh, and the Alps. To the east of that, not very far, just a few hundred miles, um, uh, Carniolans uh, evolved. They are both in what we call evolutionary lineage at sea. <laughs> and then the biggest range of all is the European dark bee, which, uh, which takes in our native bee, and that is in uh, lineage uh, M. So that's why uh, we are mainly just interested in M and C. So let's just look a little bit about how they might have... Um, uh, uh, might have evolved. So take Italians. <coughs> um, they evolved in the North Mediterranean where you've guessed it, warm predictable uh, climate with long summers and short winters, hence a long forage period. And if it really annoys you, I spoke to a, a Tuscan beekeeper a few years ago and he reckoned he was extracting honey for 10 months of the year. So that's the sort of um, uh, uh, climate that Italian bees evolved in. They decided that they needed, or best suited for them, were massive colonies. So massive colonies, of course, need prolific queens that lay a lot of eggs. Laying a lot of eggs means a lot of brood. Brood is incredibly hungry, so of course they need a lot of food. And it was Beowulf Cooper who reckoned, and I don't know where he got his information from, but he reckoned that Italian bees, just for maintenance purposes, need two and a half times the amount of food as our native bees. Whether that's correct or not, I don't know, but my own personal experience is that he's probably not too far um, from the truth. How do you recognize them? Well, <clears throat> in general, if you've got anything with yellow bands in, this, uh, in, um, uh, in our islands, uh, it's probably got um, quite a heavy um, uh, amount of um, uh, it Italian genes. They are very, quite variable. If you look at some of them, um, the workers, drones and queens are actually quite dark. They're what are called a leather colour, which I've mentioned earlier. Yet there are other ones that are very, very um, uh, uh, light. Um, I call them lemons. Now, I think it was, um, I was reading Manley's book, and he reckoned that the lighter ones were bred to lighten the colour for the amateur market. Whether that's right or not, I don't know. There is a queen that I was told was bought as an Italian, so that's what an Italian queen should look like. Uh, you do get some that are uh, a brighter sort of yellow than that, and you do get some that are very much darker. 
Then Carly Islands, which don't forget, um, uh, evolved only a few hundred miles uh, to the east, where they've got different conditions. Eastern Europe, some of it's quite mountainous, where they get long cold winters, short warm summers, and abundant uh, forage. <laughs> So they've decided that they're going to winter in small clusters, presumably to conserve uh, food, with a rapid spring expansion, uh, so that they've got a lot of bees in the summer to take advantage of the uh, short forage uh, season. Now, I've spoken to several beekeepers in Eastern Europe who keep both Carniolans and Italians, and they reckon that um, Carniolans only need half the amount of food to winter on as Italians. Whether that's right or not, I don't know. <laughs> now, I'm assuming because where they come from, winter losses are probably naturally quite high. They are uh, swarmy, and inveterate swarmers is, um, is a description that's used in many, uh, many books. I know there are some people who claim, claim that they've bred the swarminess out of them, um, but not the ones that I've seen. <clears throat> so the recognition of those, they're a darkish color. Um, <clears throat> there may be some yellow or gray, because don't forget, um, we're talking about biology and biology itself is very variable. The key is the wide uh, tormentor. So what's the tormentor? Uh, this is a photograph that was taken earlier this year by uh, Martina, one of our members at Whisper Green, who um, comes from the Czech Republic. She went back home, and I think these are her grandpa's bees, who I believe is 90, uh, so he's still keeping bees. Um, that um, band of uh, whiter or lighter hair that goes across the abdominal segment, um, that is called the uh, tormentor. And the, um, the really serious people measure the fourth abdominal segment back from the head end. So you very often see bees like this with wide tormentor, and you can be fairly certain that um, uh, they've got uh, a carniolan or, or carnica in their uh, hemolympho. I nearly said blood. But <laughs> and then finally, the North European honeybee. Uh, which is uh, our native uh, subspecies, native to the whole of Northern Europe, north of the Alps and Pyrenees, uh, out to the Atlantic seaboard in the west and the Urals on the right, and as far north as bees would survive naturally. So obviously that's below the tree line. Where, as we know, throughout that range, uh, winters are long, and this is a key bit, cool, unpredictable summers unpredictable summers. So of course variable conditions, uh, they need bees that are adaptable and it's reckoned uh, by the experts that um, our native bee, Apis mellifera mellifera, is the most adaptable of all the subspecies. So what has that done? Uh, or what's evolution done for that? Um, smaller uh, brood nests, so um, non-prolific queens that don't lay as many uh, eggs. Uh, it said that they have long-lived bees. Now, I'll put a question mark there because, uh, to the best of my knowledge, there haven't been any, uh, any studies. All I will say is that for the amount of brood that's in the hives, there's usually a lot of uh, bees in proportion to perhaps Italians or, or Carniolans. So my guess is that if the bees do live a week or two weeks longer than everything uh, else, then obviously that's why there are more bees in the colony. They're very definitely frugal. Uh, they look after their food very well, and they've got several techniques uh, for doing so. One of which is queens um, reducing laying or going off when there's a real nectar dearth. Now, the flight lower temperatures, uh, both workers, drones and queens, that's well known. And you might think, well, why do they need to fly, fly at low, low temperatures? They can't collect any food. They probably can't. But think what bees do during the winter. Um, despite what you might read, I'm absolutely adamant that bees collect water during the winter because I've seen them uh, on sh very shallow uh, puddles. You, very, you don't very often see them on, on deeper puddles, but shallow is probably been the sun on it. 
And of course, uh, they can get out and defecate. Whereas the bees that don't fly, um, if they do get um, caught a tiny bit short, they defecate within the hive. If there's any nosema spores there, of course, the other bees come and clean it up and um, uh, uh, adds to the infection. And of course, they're hardy, which we, which, which we know about. If all the writers um, talk about that. Recognition is they're darkish. Um, they have been accused of being the old British black or whatever, but they're actually quite brown in some in some places. And of course, right across Europe, they've all they've got different names, although it is actually the same subspecies, although maybe a different uh, ecotype. No yellow at all. Narrow tormentor. So you can get two dark bees side by side. If one's got a narrow tormentor, you can say it's probably got a higher percentage of AMM and ATB. Uh, if it's right next to one with a wide tormentor, you can say it's probably got quite a bit of carnica in it. This is a photograph I took in Switzerland several years ago. Um, and that um, uh, was DNA uh, checked as absolutely pure AMM. Look at the queen. Uh, look at the bees. So there's no um, no white tormentor there, no yellow uh, at all. You may have read the historical accounts of um, uh, a native British black bee or, or whatever. Um, now, most of them were written so long ago that you can't really challenge them, but I do question the reliability uh, of some of them because a lot of the writers, uh, they had vested interests. Um, they were either selling or breeding uh, uh, queens and um, uh, what better way of selling your own than discrediting somebody else's. Um, so they, they said it, it was disease. They blamed it for the Isle of Wight disease. They said it was bad tempered. And if beekeepers didn't believe that, they said it was extinct. <clears throat> what probably quite certain is that they may not have been dealing with entirely uh, pure bees. So the bad temper, of course, may have been caused by um, uh, 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 by mating with um, uh, with um, other uh, other races. And there's been a huge amount of cutting and pasting ever since. Just look on websites, uh, books, um, and you'll see there might be a few words change, but it's just cut and paste, cut and paste, cut and paste. Now there are AMM opponents, <coughs> always have been and still are. They may have a commercial reason to do so. Um, they may be perhaps uh, importing uh, other uh, bees or, or importing them, breeding them up or, or, or whatever. There's certainly quite a lot of people who believe and still peddle the usual cut and paste that they're extinct, chase you up the garden path, uh, their runners run around on the comb, colonies are too small, all sorts of things like that, um, which um, uh, you, can, you, you can generally just sit down and have a chat with and you can dispel each one of those. But as I've already um, hinted, not all black bees are native. Uh, they could well be a mongrel uh, with perhaps a carnica. Uh, what I do know is when I speak to some of these people and ask them if they've um, ever handled uh, AMM, uh, generally the answer's uh, no, and actually they've got little knowledge of it. They just want to knock it for the sake of knocking it and, uh, and pushing their own um, uh, views. A color study, which Norman Carrick mentioned in his, uh, in his presentation, which I'll briefly go through. Uh, there's a report that was released in 2014 Study was done in 21 European locations where the local strain and two of foreign origins were tested uh, side by side. Um, I, as I understand it, 621 colonies all told in 11 countries. So it's not a small uh, sample really. And the conclusion I came to that was in every case, the locally adapted bees perform best in all cases. Well, they needn't really have done the study because that's what um, uh, what we've been told for the last 40 million years. So the results of importation, well, hybridization and mongrelization, as I've said, um, we've ended up over the years with quite a lot of what I will call uh, man-made hybrids. <coughs> 
Uh, Starline and Midnight were uh, American hybrids, and Buckfast, of course, was um, uh, English. Um, certainly, Starline and Midnight uh, are no longer uh, in existence, or to the best of my knowledge, they're not. And as I understand it, they just cost so much to uh, to maintain the stocks that um, uh, uh, that they just uh, gave up. Um, and Buckfast, I will. Um, uh, discuss those uh, a little bit uh, later. But of course, if you have a man-made hybrid, it's made for a particular purpose, <coughs> which gives perhaps a short-term benefit uh, for a very small number uh, of people and long-term problems for uh, everybody else. So hybrids, um, what are they? In my book, uh, a hybrid is just a straight cross between two pure races, which gives the short-term benefits, usually, of stability and characteristics. Uh, so behavior and that sort of thing is going to be uh, very similar. And of course, you get what Brother Adam uh, must have discovered early on, hybrid vigor. Um, so uh, some of the abilities of the bees, such as perhaps uh, collecting uh, nectar, um, are, um, uh, are in increased. They may be imported, more than likely they are, because of course in, the, in those areas, island mating and that sort of thing is much easier than it is in this country. The thing is though, they certainly don't last very long because the next generation are straight into mongrels and many beekeepers who use them um, will readily admit they've got to replace them every year or two. And of course, what does that do? It makes them unsustainable. So mongrels um, is the next generation um, where one parent is a crossbred. And I keep being told off for uh, using the word mongrel, um, but really I don't think there's anything else that describes it. Now, there can be a great variation uh, in, in them. And as I say, I do get around quite a bit um, inspecting people's bees. I'm not a bee inspector. I just go for de and do demonstrations and that sort of thing. And some of them can be uh, very, very good. And some, quite frankly, I'll put bad there, but I mean, actually mean awful. Um, and um, uh, it's nobody's fault, really. If that's all people have got, then that's, uh, that's all they know and they assume everybody else's bees are exactly the same. <clears throat> now, in reality, it's what many of us have got. Apart from those who are lucky enough to be in an area um, with, where they've got pure bees, the most of us have got mongrelization integration of um, uh, one degree or another. I think they can be improved. In fact, I know uh, they can because I'm living proof the, that it's, it's possible. Um, that's, what I, that's what I've been doing for years. So have a lot of other people uh, as well. And that bit, one of the things we try, we're trying to do is encourage um, the improvement of whatever we've got uh, locally. And personally, I think um, the vast majority of, of people in our islands, if they just stick to what there is locally, um, they will... Um, uh, they will um, they will improve. It might take a bit of time, but they will improve. Don't have to bring anything in uh, in from uh, uh, some distance away. So my own experience over the years, <clears throat> I started keeping bees soon after 1962-63 winter. In fact, the following June, um, there were very heavy losses, and the figures I've seen quoted are nationwide uh, 80 percent. Um, now, I put neglect there with a question mark after it because um, when I was um, uh, young, I was lucky enough to, um, or when I first started really, I was lucky enough to um, uh, spend a lot of time with a man who went round to other people's uh, looking after their bees. And at one stage, I reckon he looked after 400 colonies. So uh, as a youngster, I, I was chucked in at the deep, the, the deep end. And looking back... <clears throat> The beekeepers in those days were nowhere near as careful as they are now. And I'm pretty certain that neglect was a result, um, resulted in um, 
uh, a, a lot of losses. Very few people use mouse cards. Um, in my area, West Sussex, um, there was snow on the ground for 14 weeks. Further up uh, country, um, that would have been um, uh, increased. Uh, I think pretty, pretty much uh, neglect. If anyone wants to ask any question about that, I'm happy to expand uh, uh, later on. Uh, remaining bees, what did beekeepers do? Uh, one of two things. They either split the remaining bees and um, just let them produce their own emergency cells, effectively what the Americans call a walkaway split, or uh, they used imported queens. Um, mainly Italian, a few starts or some starlight uh, midnights and some buck fast. But of course, notice they all came from warmer climates. All of them, because buck fast in those days were, I believe, uh, raised in Israel. Unfortunately, uh, I bought some too, but not for very long. Um, of course, I only bought the Italians because uh, as a teenager, that's all I could afford. And uh, they were 11 shillings at the time. There were also a lot of package bees that came in from the United States as well. And these were also the bright yellow, um, either Italians or uh, star lines. There was a huge nosema and acarin problem uh, soon afterwards. And at that time, we probably had between 40 and 50 uh, county beekeeping instructors. And I, I remember speaking to some of them, and they were absolutely flat out testing for nosema and acarin. Beekeepers don't do it now, but it was purely because of mainly the Italians and the Italian hybrids that were coming in. And uh, they were just going down with uh, Nozema particularly, uh, almost straight away. I bought, for, uh, soon after that, I bought 42 colonies of bees off one of our members who was going blind. 19 of them were package bees that he bought from uh, the United States. They all died one winter and they are all absolutely riddled with uh, no SEMA. Uh, luckily, we don't get that now. Within about 10 years, all those bees are gone. So all the bright yellow jobbies, they, 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 they had gone. They simply did not survive. Even as a youngster, <clears throat> um, uh, after a couple of three years, I realized the local bees were actually much better than uh, the imports uh, that I had. And I now, realize that we'd have been far far better if we just simply propagated from the survivors uh, than panicked as they did after the isle of wight um, uh, epidemic and um, uh, in, in, in imported here's five colonies here right underneath the uh, uh, south downs that in august 1963 i helped the man i was t uh, telling you about um, take over a hundred pound from each of those colonies. It's a little, tiny little village called Duncton in West Sussex, uh, which is on the scarp slope of the uh, uh, South Downs. Uh, it was in an old uh, orchard and where they are now, where those bees are, is, um, is very typical of where beekeepers used to keep uh, bees in my, in, when I started, because a, a lot of people of course worked on uh, farms and uh, you know they just put um, um, put bees where, where, where there's a bit of space uh, anyway there were five colonies there every one of those had come through the previous winter now if you take the national average four out of five should have been lost <coughs> every one of them on single brood WBC so 100 pound of honey off each one um, of single brood WBC, and how many people say that um, uh, uh, that you can't get big crops off single brood chambers? Now, my area is what um, I call a middling area for forage. At that time, it was reckoned that um, if you got 30 banner of honey per colony, you were doing pretty well. And of course, if obviously, when, as soon as obviously rate came, um, it, uh, it got up to £100 for everybody but this 1963 was pre-LC rape those bees were dark what i've now come to 
know as near native uh, bees. Um, and they were lovely bees to handle, even as a youngster. Um, you know, I didn't, didn't get stung. Now in visiting others, getting around the country quite a bit, I do go to quite a lot of marginal areas um, uh, where obviously the, the, um, the forage is poor. And in some places, beekeepers can't keep more than four or perhaps six colonies um, because it just isn't uh, enough uh, forage. Um, typical sort of areas are where there's intense agriculture, um, where it's, um, it's usually flat. Uh, you, there aren't many hedges, there aren't many trees, um, and they're growing corn or potatoes or carrots or something. And um, uh, there's virtually nothing uh, for the bees or in the areas of um, uh, harsher conditions. Uh, sheep pasture is um, usually not very good uh, for bees, but you get up, um, get up height, you know, a thousand feet or perhaps a bit, uh, uh, a, a bit above, and uh, it can sometimes be quite harsh there, especially when you get up to uh, 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 mid, what, mid Wales or uh, or Scotland. <clears throat> but of course, there's often a poor choice of bee. The locals usually know what they're doing, usually. Um, but um, in a lot of these places, um, people either start beekeeping or they come in from outside and bring their bees with them. And the bees just don't suit the conditions. But of course, they're influenced by the adverts uh, that tell them how wonderful these particular bees are. But they don't say, look, they know they're not going to survive in, um, in, in marginal areas. These are the ones that have to be fed uh, uh, during the, the summer, and some of them I'm pretty certain are fed almost all the year round. So, of course, they uh, subsequently have heavy losses. Having said that, <coughs> I do get around and see some pockets of really, really good bees, uh, as well as the, uh, the, the poorer ones. Um, in heavily mongrelized areas, there tends to be quite a bit more aggression colony aggression I mean, not, not beekeepers, um, uh, although I, I guess people are going to argue about that. But anyway, coming colony aggression, then um, where the bees are, are much more, uh, the type is much more stable. F2 aggression seems to be something that's only applicable um, to honeybees. And it tends to be the early crosses of pure queens the next, so you perhaps you get um, uh, an Italian queen or a Carney Island queen or whatever. The next generation is usually okay. So the daughter queen is usually okay. But sometimes the, um, the granddaughter um, uh, can head colonies. Uh, that can be quite vicious, uh, even if the original queen uh, was docile. And very often you go to a meeting and somebody says, God, my bees were, were bad tempered. Uh, uh, today, uh, and somebody else said, "Well, that happened to me for you know six weeks ago or whatever, and they've been uh, devils ever since." It's probably because there's been a change of queen. Now, I'm very def definitely not a geneticist, so I can just about spell it, and that's all I know about it. But um, I've been told that apparently there's a one in four chance of aggression in the second generation. I put three question marks there because. Um, uh, that's what people have told me. Generally, people like biology teachers and uh, 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 and uh, those uh, those sort of people. Um, that's about what I think is correct, uh, anyway, from my own uh, observation. Here is the arm of a uh, beekeeper with the um, with the tunic taken off. I think you'll find twenty seven or twenty eight uh, stings there. <clears throat> That was the sleeve of his um, uh, uh, tunic. You can see from that that that's quite tough material. It's um, I'm not I'm not a, uh, not an expert on material, but that that seems to be almost like a sort of light canvas, one of the heavier gauges. Uh, anyway, <coughs> um, it has unfortunately become a common problem. That beekeeper has got about thirty or forty colonies of uh, of bees. Um, I think he works them with his uh, with his brother. He is a good, genuine, sound, knowledgeable beekeeper. 
Um, to the best of my knowledge, his handling is very good. He's certainly not going to uh, a crash bang merchant who's going to wind, wind the bees up. All he was trying to do, or all he is trying to do, is keep decent bees for himself and the neighbourhood. Problem is, where he is, he's surrounded by other beekeeping associations, and they all seem to have different views of what bees to use. And you know what it's like in, in some beekeeping associations? Uh, somebody makes a noise, must have this, must have that, must have some, something else. It's very usually uh, a case of, oh, I happen to have one in my pocket. Is, uh, have you got 35 quid on you sort of thing? Uh, anyway, um, they were all imports or buck fast, but all different. And, uh, of course, um, uh, this chap was right in the middle, getting absolutely hammered by uh, everybody to the point where he was resorted to instrumental insemination uh, and that, uh, that arm that I showed you was as a result of him going to his own bees to try and get some um, uh, drones uh, to inseminate. The bees were a good 100 yards away, if not 200 yards. Uh, they were in light woodland uh, and there was a great big tall hedge, probably 25 20, 25 foot high in between us. And uh, there, there was I, and indeed Carl Collier. Um, and we both got absolutely hammered as well. So this is the sort of thing that can happen. Um, as some of you know, I do uh, two day uh, bee improvement courses as well. And exactly the same thing happened on, on one of those. Um, a, a teaching apiary, <coughs> Um, that we um, that we needed to get some material from, and the bees were absolutely evil. They um, they picked on the two people who were uh, taking the samples, and they got exactly the same thing. The surrounding beekeepers or beekeeping associations uh, bring in uh, Im imports from outside. But of course, who gets the blame for it? Not the imports, is it? It's always the local bees. Now I'll get back to buck fast because I have mentioned them um, uh, quite a bit. And this is my uh, own observation. Um, they're often referred to as a breed. Um, they're very definitely uh, not a breed. They're very often referred to as a hybrid. Well, I've described a hybrid as far as, um, I, um, uh, uh, as I understand it. <coughs> Probably in the early days when all Brother Adam was doing was crossing uh, imported um, uh, Italians with the local bees. Yes, um, they were hybrids, but of course, all the tinkering that's gone on uh, uh, in between, uh, in my view, probably puts them in the mongrel uh, category. So being cynical about it, you could argue that we've all got mongrels. They're very variable. Um, okay, you check this. Just have a look at the websites of people who sell them. Have a look at the queens. Have a look at the bees and you'll see that they are very, very variable. Remember a few slides ago, I tried to describe the uh, three uh, main races. You'll see certainly two of them, Italians and Carniolans, in, um, uh, in many of those pictures that you, um, uh, that you've shown uh, online. Also, I've uh, seen ever so many colonies that are purported to be buckfast and they're very variable too. Now the interesting thing is when I started nearly 60 years ago now um, a few people used buckfast uh, in those days and those that did the buckfast in those days was a very very different bee than it is these days. Um, it was um, it, it, it was darker the queens were darker the um, um, although the workers were uh, did have uh, bands. Virtually all the bees in the hives had the had uh, uh, look look the same. The colouring uh, was was the same. But these days you get all sorts of colours, and the bees are so soft. You you handle them. There's absolutely no vibrancy to them whatsoever. Uh, or some of the buckfast I've seen. I can't find a definition for buckfast anywhere. Um, now, if something is being marketed as something, you at least expect a description of it. But if you try to speak to um, 
uh, supporters of Buckfast, they cannot tell you. Um, but you go on various websites and you'll um, find that whoever they are, they're used in all sorts of different combinations. Now, there may well be some good breeders. I haven't got any uh, disagreement with that. Probably those that are into island mating, so you do get the genuine <coughs> uh, uh, crosses. Um, but I'm asking if there's any unreliable suppliers. I'll put a question mark there um, because um, we, um, uh, we see them advertised as open mated and all sorts of things like that. Uh, so how can they be um, uh, buck fast? Once again, unsustainable. If you want to maintain them, you've got to keep buying more. And even Brother Adam said that. <clears throat> um, well, it was all right for him because he had an abbey to keep going. Interesting thing is the Abbey, Buckfast Abbey, they haven't bred bees for um, certainly 10, 12, might even be 15 years uh, now. But of course, I think people keep buying them because of the romantic link with this dear old monk who's carried up in uh, 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 Mount Kilimanjaro or somewhere in the sedan chair. Um, and, uh, you know, even the, uh, uh, the suppliers um, have got this romantic link to... Uh, to, to to dear old monk, and I'm sure that a lot of those that are sold as Buckfast have never been anywhere near Buckfast Abbey. But doesn't matter where you go, the used Buckfast they've got a reputation for aggression in subsequent generations, um, and I I hear that everywhere. And uh, if uh, if I go to a uh, and do a, a talk somewhere and mention that, there are a lot of people nodding their heads. Here's an example. <clears throat> in autumn 2018, I was asked to remove nine colonies. Um, uh, unfortunate situation. Beekeeper died, I think, on a Sunday or Monday. Uh, lived in rented accommodation, and the owner wanted everything cleared out by Friday. Um, well, managed to get it extended to Sunday, but um, uh, I had to take those nine colonies and put them in my garden. There's nowhere for, uh, else for them to go. I was told by the man's brother-in-law, who wasn't a beekeeper, that they'd been requeened by Buckfast with Buckfast two years earlier. Now, he wasn't a beekeeper, so he probably wouldn't have known about Buckfast. But I can tell you that all nine of those colonies were absolutely evil. They were, um, they were very, very difficult to handle. I'd have requeened a lot more or less straight away. Free living colonies, uh, some call them wild, some call them uh, feral. Um, I got told off a week or so ago for calling them feral. Uh, I should be calling them free living. So I would call them free living. So unmanaged colonies then. Over the years, I've removed uh, several hundred colonies, many of them uh, pre, pre varroa. So I think I know a little bit about how wild colonies, uh, free living colonies or whatever, uh, live. Now, if they've been established for some time, <coughs> the queens are usually darkish. You do not get the bright yellow, what I call lemons, that I see in managed colonies. If you look at the drones, they're usually darkish as well. You do not get yellow drones if they, when I say established for some time, I mean they've been in there for one winter. <laughs> so fairly short time, really, but they, they, they'd gone through uh, one difficult period. Uh, workers, yes, you will probably get those uh, quite a lot with uh, yellow bands, but certainly not the queens. And the queens are non-prolific. You just do not get these that um, uh, lay up great big masses of, uh, of brew. That is not a natural thing in our part of the world. They're always healthy. <clears throat> if they're not healthy, they're going to be dead. And of course, they are survivors because they've got to be. Now, the exotic types um, don't, don't live very long. They really don't. What it is really is natural se selection that um, uh, two people by the name of Wallace and Darwin uh, were telling us about 180 years ago. <clears throat> I personally think the bees have got it right. And to me, what suits nature should suit us. Otherwise, we're into mollycoddling, which is what a lot of 
beekeepers do to their bees. What do I mean by mollycoddling? Feeding very often summer and winter. I see so many people in June or, uh, uh, you know, May or June feeding their bees. What on earth for? If they were up in a tree, they'd be dead. <clears throat> All the medication and supplements and that sort of thing that people give their bees and insulate them too. This is just to keep them alive. They don't have that in the wild. <laughs> Tough bees are going to survive. The softies don't. So if we keep mollycoddling, all we're doing is um, uh, keeping genes going of bees that won't um, that, that nature would take out. This is an obvious question. <coughs> Why are bees that evolved in a really much warmer climate it's considered to be better than what we already have? Well, there's got to be an answer, but I'm not sure I know it. So you folk really need tell me so perhaps um uh instead of telling me you email um uh, carl and, and, and you tell him because i don't know but what do people do they lose them and then go and buy more of the same doesn't make sense to me in fact i was talking to somebody um from uh new york state today and uh, in, the, in in the states and he was telling me about exactly the same thing exactly the same thing so how can we move on then? <clears throat> Do we actually want to? I don't know. It's up to beekeeping uh, uh, in general, not just me. Are we fed up with what we have? Personally, I am. Is there a sustainable option? Sustainable again, look. Can we achieve it? Personally, I think we've got to say yes to all of them. But we've still got the importers of people that use uh, imports. Personally, I don't think we should be running around blaming people and pointing fingers uh, and uh, uh, that sort of thing. I really don't think it would be any good, uh, do any good. I think we've all got to work together. I think we can explain things uh, to people, put, put, the, um, uh, put the message across and just try, try and do it by persuasion. Personally, I think we need a lot of understanding and we need a lot of tolerance of other people's uh, views as well. So in simple terms, I think we need to reduce uh, imports. Um, we've got to replace those queens somehow, so we raise them for the most suitable of what we've already got. If, as part of the operation, we replace those that are unsuitable, um, uh, then I think we've got, we're, um, we're going a long way to achieving what we should do. The least suitable will probably succumb and they will be uh, the losses. And my guess is, but obviously I haven't yet got any proof, my guess is um, that after a few years, winter losses will drop considerably. <clears throat> Whatever we've got left, it's got to improve because either nature's taken it out or uh, we, 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 we've done it before then. If they're going to improve, I hope they're going to be healthy, they're going to be hardy, productive, and the key thing is uh, survivors because that's how nature works. <clears throat> so why improve bees anyway? Well, we've got two reasons um, uh, that I can think of. One's improving for the beekeeper and the other one is for the bees. So for the beekeeper, we probably want bees that have got characteristics that suit us. Now that may not suit the bees, um, but let's talk about it. Let's try, and, um, uh, let's try and work things out. As far as the bees are concerned, um, I know it's human thinking, um, but I think probably all they're interested in is uh, survival. That's all. And of course, in doing that, uh, they really must suit the environment. Uh, if we improve bees, we really need to do it sustainably. And that word's coming up yet again. So sustainable bees, beekeeping without imports, is it possible? <coughs> well, we've had 10,000 uh, years uh, without uh, imports. There are at least three places within 
what one might term our catchment area um, that have had close populations for over 25 years. Collinsy, uh, the Isle of Man and Orkney. Uh, all of those have got bees and they're all doing uh, absolutely fine. So yes, absolutely no argument at all. We do not need um, uh, imports and we may be without imports in the future because even in my time um, we had an import ban for about five years before Varroa was um, uh, uh, detected and we, we just got on and did things. Um, I wasn't here at the time, I was born um, after the uh, war um, but I understand that uh, during the war there were no imports either. <clears throat> so what are we up against? Well the majority of queens come from the uh, EU. Um, there are a few who come from uh, elsewhere, but the NBU figures um, for queen imports from 2011 to 2019 are on this graph. And when I say imports, that's what's booked in, not necessarily what arrived. In 2011, uh, it was 4,568 plus, of course, those that came from the, the, um, uh, the uh, non-EU countries. And only eight years later, it rocketed to 23,070. What it is this year, uh, I don't know. Uh, but that's a five-fold increase in eight years. Now, I've got a sneaking suspicion that the number of colonies is roughly the same. Um, that would need, uh, need checking. I want to see us return to this or below because it was okay eight years ago we roughly the same number of colonies it should be uh, now. So how can we do it? Well we can overcome some of the needs. Notice that I put needs in inverted commas. So we're dealing with amateur beekeepers and commercial and they may have different needs uh, obviously but are they actually genuine or are they perceived? When I speak to people about why they import bees, um, uh, I think the reasons they give me can very, very easily be overcome. Simple things like just perhaps modifying management uh, will, will do the trick. <clears throat> but again, I try to do things by persuasion, not force. Just, just, just chat to them, have a little bit of a chat. As soon as we start um, laying down rules, you must do this, you must do something that, you must do something else. Um, I think we've really lost the argument. <clears throat> so people who need queens early in the year, well, how do we deal with that? Well, one of the ways, of course, we're reducing winter losses. Why not make up losses before they happen? So perhaps knocking up uh, nukes um, in back end of July or August, um, uh, you can do it very, very easily. Um, without any problem at all. You just bring them through the winter, um, you overwinter the colony, and of course you overwinter queens as well. There are some people who are now overwintering queens in, uh, in, in mini nukes. Um, that's thinking about it. That really is because they, um, they feel they're getting better bees, or better queens anyway. <clears throat> How often do you hear, from, especially from beekeeping associations, oh, uh, beginners want early nukes, we've got to buy them in. Well, quite frankly, I think the I want, I want, I want, I want it three weeks ago mentality uh, doesn't really suit beekeeping. Tell them they got to wait. Um, there's, you're not going to gain any more by having a, a, a nuke in, um, in May than you are in April. <laughs> and of course, how many people say, oh, the, the queens are cheap? Well, they might be, but the home re rib ones, if you do it properly, are a lot cheaper. So some reasons for the imports then, they produce more honey. <clears throat> Don't know how many times I hear that, um, and in print as well. Do they? What they've been judged against? Produce more honey every year? Are you sure? That's not a lot of people's experience, because a lot of, um, a lot of beekeepers will tell you that um, uh, the sort of local, local bees uh, will produce honey every year. These, um, a lot of these imports, uh, yes, they might produce a lot in the good year, uh, but they've got to be fed in the bad year. 
Is it not an yet another of beekeeping's myths? And has the feeding been allowed for? I think Peter Jenkins um, uh, put up a slide about this. There's no point um, uh, uh, feeding a colony 40 pound of um, syrup if you're only going to get an extra 15 pound of honey off it. <clears throat> Keep hearing that local bees are aggressive. Well, we've been through that. Um, uh, and it could well be because they're being crossed with the imports that are coming in. <clears throat> There's a commercial pressure and uh, interest uh, as well. There are a lot of queens being sold and there are a lot of being sold by quite small organisations too. Uh, so of course the, the seller's persuasive uh, adverts um, could easily be believed. A lot of beekeepers actually don't know how to produce bees and queens. And I'm including in that quite a lot of commercial beekeepers uh, as well. They simply don't know how to do it. It's a common problem. Uh, what we need to do, of course, is improve the knowledge uh, and skill levels of beekeepers uh, overall. And I'm not so sure that um, a lot of beekeeping associations teach their, their members how to produce bees and queens. Um, yes, so go and uh, teach them a load of other stuff that they may not need, uh, but not the sort of things that always the things that they do need. But I'll discuss that in my next uh, webinar. How often do you go to a queen rearing talk and the uh, speaker pitches straight in at grafting, um, straight away? That's about all they talk about. It's over the heads of 80% of the people that are listening. Uh, they think it's complicated. That's way above my, my head. I can't mess around with that. It's a lot easier to buy a queen. So then, of course, uh, the beekeeper becomes uh, lazy on the internet. <coughs> And uh, the following day or the day after, uh, along comes a queen without all the, the hassle that they were told was necessary. Not to worry, folks, there is hope. The background genetics is actually still quite good uh, throughout, throughout the country. Okay, there are going to be pockets where it's quite low. Um, um, the free living populations, in my experience, are very, very often much better than some of the managed colonies uh, I see. So the bees in the wild are uh, they're tougher, uh, they're, 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 they're more stable, and they um, uh, and the survivors. <clears throat> I think there are quite a lot of beekeepers, especially ones that are coming into beekeeping now they're coming, be, becoming much more aware of what they're doing uh, and the, their actions, and they want things that are local. We can include Varroa uh, resilience, and I've used the word resilience because um, uh, a lot of people that are going down this road are changing from uh, uh, tolerance and all sorts of words like that to, uh, uh, to resilience. <coughs> There are now very definitely more beekeepers uh, producing queens from their selected colonies and culling the, uh, culling the poorer ones. Um, I'm seeing that uh, uh, quite a bit more. So people have actually caught on and good luck to them as well. There is help and guidance. Certainly Bibber can help, but they're not the only um, uh, source by any means. What I will say is it is not difficult because over the years, the bees have done it entirely on their own. If they can do it, I can do it, you can do it. <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about the bees in my area because uh, they've been very carefully selected uh, over um, a quarter period. And they have actually changed character from what they were 15 or 20 years ago. They do have the characteristics of native bees. They're very definitely not native. I don't think they are. Um, but they've got the characteristic native bees, and um, uh, that's because um, uh, they, they've been, been uh, selected that way. <clears throat> they can be kept on a single brood chamber uh, all year round, so summer and uh, winter. Uh, there's less work for them, not very swarmy. I've currently got 26 colonies at the bottom of my garden at the moment. Um, uh, one of them attempted to swarm uh, last year. Well, you know, it's last went uh, summer. 
uh, in Whisper Green Teach in April. There's 20 colonies there and one attempted to swarm there. So they're not very swarmy at all. Uh, they winter well, our losses are low. Very, very, very much less feeding than um, the I see uh, people poking food in, into, um, into their colonies. There's food in the brood box all year round. And I do go to other places. In fact, I went to one in, in July, only about 25 miles from me, I suppose. And it was a brood box was absolutely bone dry, absolutely bone dry. <clears throat> and they suit the climate. And we get a good crop every year. Um, not, not a case of, oh, it's been, been a bad year, we've had to feed them all. We get a good crop every year. We can all do it, folks. All, all of us, every one of you that's listening, we can all do it. So where to now? Well, I'm going to try and explain in the next two uh, webinars. In my view, we need to perhaps educate or re-educate uh, beekeepers, um, uh, teachers, demonstrators, apiary managers, all those sort of people, so that hopefully we're all, um, we're, we're, we're all working together. We probably need to change culture a bit. So get people away from the, you must have the big colonies and you must have the bright yellow queens and big queens and all sorts of things like that, which I will discuss in the, I think it's the next uh, webinar. <clears throat> um, we need somehow to try and reduce the imports uh, and needs. Well, simply, if people didn't buy them, others wouldn't sell them. It's as simple as that. So produce bees and queens in the UK. We can do it. We've done it in the past. We've got a history of it. And uh, we've got the expertise. Um, there's, uh, there's no issue as far as I'm concerned. And hopefully as a result of that, we'll get better bees that suit both the beekeepers and the bees. I suggest you read this book, The Principles of Bee Improvement uh, by Joe Whittacombe. Uh, it's the best book of that type that I know. Um, there are others that sort, sort of attempt it, um, but this I think covers absolutely everything. And the great thing about it is um, you can understand it. it's not over your head. Um, it's not, not in jargon at all. Uh, Joe's done a really good, good job of that. And finally, <clears throat> almost finally, uh, this video here from John Chambers, uh, it's on the National Honey Show uh, website, Basic, basic Honey uh, Bee Genetics for Beekeepers. Um, listen to that and just keep listening to it because John's got from some really good information and some really good justification for a lot of things as well. So all I can ask really is that you develop the bees in, uh, uh, bees in your area because parachuting queens in often causes problems that results in more being parachuted in and so on. Thanks very much. I've probably gone way over the top, haven't I? Almost, yeah. So thanks very much, folks, uh, for listening. Uh, any, any questions? Well, thank you very much for that, Roger. Um, I must give you and everybody a warning We've been inundated with questions, uh, 36 so far, and it's still going up. Uh, there's some great questions, and if, if you don't mind, I'm going to be how, saving how, a few how, of them. How, for, do, you know, how for, do you know they're great? Because they're difficult to answer. Ah, right, okay. Yeah, but yeah, they're um, difficult for you. some of those for the panel, so we could have a few different opinions uh, <laughs> on that one. But if, if I could indulge you in a few questions, Roger, but... Um, please, we'll try to keep them brief so we can rattle through them. Uh, if you kept breeding with only a few colonies, how long do you think it would take to drastically improve them to become more native? Uh, well, it depends what you start with, of course. Um, uh, when, say, native, um, I've only got experience, really, of uh, changing characteristics to... Um, uh, to sort of what I've called native type. So they've got the characteristics, but they're not genetically uh, native. Uh, they're probably all, all sorts of things. Um, what, what, what I found was that very early on, you can make, uh, you can make ra absolute rapid strides. Like literally, I mean, 
perhaps the first two or three generations, you can make absolute rapid strides. Now, what you don't have to do is what um, uh, we're, what you're often told. Uh, it's only second year queens that you can assess. Um, uh, I, I, I don't think that's true because you, you, I, I found you can do it a lot, a lot earlier than that. So it depends. Um, on what, what you haven't mentioned, Carl, is that we're hoping to do a lot of webinars, webinars after, the, um, after the break. And this what could be the fourth season and even the fifth season, which we're, yeah, we're discussing. Yeah, this, is, this is going to be, be, uh, 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 be, be one of it. Um, but what I found is that you don't have to um, uh, wait two or three years before you assess a queen. You can do it more or less straight away. Certainly on temper and um, uh, calmness on the comb. Uh, you can also do it on colour if indeed you want to, to deal with colour. Uh, as you know, I prefer the, the, uh, the, the darker uh, queens. And um, if they emerge being light, then you, you just give them the boot treatment and that's it. Um, I'm going to have to keep you short, Roger, because yeah, uh, oh, we'll oh, through oh, a I'm few sure. more. Um, interesting story here, but I mean, someone's lucky. So... I got two swarms in the summer from a colony that had been abandoned for five years. Kept them isolated, and when I treated with Apigard for Varroa, there was virtually no mite drop. Would this suggest a Varroa, varroa resistant and worth breeding from? So, you do a uh, Varroa check and you're not finding any Varroa. <laughs> Difficult to say, but on the face of it, I'd say uh, yes. Um, it could well be... Um, we don't know the situation, but it could well be that it was a fresh swarm that went in there. And, um, uh, of course, they wouldn't have that many Varroa uh, on them. It, 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 it's difficult to say. But on the face of it, I think probably yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hopefully it's a relatively simple, quick one. Uh, AMM fly at low temperatures, you mentioned. What sort of temperatures are you talking about that you would hope that, to see them flying at? <laughs> oh, um, I'm well. I'm not in an AMM area, but I, I speak to um, uh, people who are, and they're talking about nine. Yeah, nine. Um, hang on, yeah, centigrade that is, yeah. or Celsius, or whatever they call it these days. Well, I, I've got a mixture in my garden, and the darker ones fly at below ten. Um, yeah, what what is interesting if you get it. Um, cold, if you've got a mixed colony with mixed colours, um, you not always, but you very often find that if it's right on the point of whether they're flying or not, what you very often find is it's the only, only the dark ones that fly, the, the, the lighter ones don't. Um, I don't know the reason for that. Um, no doubt um, the scientists somewhere have, have, have done, uh, done an experiment on it or done a study and uh, and could, could could tell us um but you've you i very often see it because i've got um a lot of bees at the bottom of my garden and i'm down there two or three times a day uh just having a look at the entrance and see what's going on yeah i, I played with an open syrup feeder uh this autumn for the first time just on the terrace of my back garden and uh i, I need to get some photographs because the first ones that come are the darker ones and then it gets lighter during the day yeah, yeah. The bees get lighter as it gets warmer. Yeah, I, I don't, I, I think it's a bit dangerous to say that that's what happens, um, because I think it needs more investigation. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. okay, okay, right. Uh, someone lives in suburbia where there's far less fruit trees and flowers in the gardens. Most of the flowers also seem to be the hybrid type and useless for bees. <laughs> what do you feel about the current suburban gardens? Um, I'm not going to ask, ask that question because I don't answer that question because I don't know. Um, but I'm going to make the point in the in the next webinar uh, that um, if you've got prolific colonies that need a lot more food, um, you need a lot more flowers to keep a colony uh, going. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you've got less prolific colonies, so smaller colonies, um, uh, they don't need so much forage. Now, I know that isn't um, quite the question that, that, that was asked. I don't know. I, I, 
uh, I don't go to sub suburbia very often. <laughs> so I, 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 I really don't know. Um, okay. Um, well, the, the, thing, the thing is, Carl, honestly, um, I could say what, what I think, um, yeah. but I, I don't want to mislead people who live in uh, suburbia. Yeah, well, I, I've been to three gardens. Uh, on bee related calls this year that have astroturf for their entire back garden. I've never seen that before. <coughs> yeah. Um, but it, it, the, actually, the question um, uh, brings up a lot of other issues, one of which is that perhaps at beekeep, as beekeepers, um, in general, we really ought to try and um, uh, get local authorities, no sort of people, um, to, to plant different, uh, different plants. Yeah. different trees yeah. um, just one or two more questions if you don't mind what would you do with an aggressive colony if you have no spare queens and none available locally i'd give it give it away to somebody i didn't like um, <laughs> yeah, you posted some to me didn't you right uh okay um yeah that's actually quite a difficult one yeah um so you haven't got any <laughs> that's not somebody trying to stitch me up is it <laughs> um, no no i think it's a genuine question oh right um, okay uh yeah so there's there's no other bees anywhere near so you've got no spare queens and none available locally yeah no oh right um <clears throat> if it's really aggressive some people aren't going to be saying this but i've raised queens from a great aggressive colony deliberately and you can actually get through the aggression mm. it doesn't necessarily mean that the next generation is going to be aggressive so i think probably what i do i'm thinking on the hoof here as i usually do i think i'd probably uh does a person say how many colonies they've got or is, okay. is it just right okay I think I'd probably try and get into it. Probably take a couple of combs away, put them in a nuke box, <clears throat> put on the stand of the colony, move the colony away so you lose the, uh, the flying bees. In general, if bees can't fly, uh, they're a lot less likely to, to, to sting. <clears throat> then I think I'd find the queen and just knock her on the head and um, um, uh, the following day, put the colony back together and just let nature take its course. You could probably go in nine days later, nine or 10 days later, and see if they've calmed down and not reduce the queen cells to one. It, it's quite an un unusual situation because generally beekeepers in associations help each other, uh, help each other out. Um, so uh, it, it does sound quite a genuine um, uh, question, although if it was right now, uh, obviously I'd say we'll keep, keep the bad tempered queen until, um, until spring. Yeah. Um, but I, I, as I say, I've, I've got through bad temper. Right. Um, there's more questions popping up. They're, they're popping up faster than we're answering them. So we'll call it quits after just two more and um, there's, there's two or three people have asked questions along a similar theme uh, insulation should it be sorry in what insulation oh insulation yeah yeah should we be giving more insulation to our bees it seems that uh, poly hives and wbc hives are good for our bees is that something we should be doing well i'd I'd ask the question, is it actually good or is it sort of masking uh, a problem with the bees uh, that nature would take out? It could well be that we're, uh, we're encouraging bees that are softer to, uh, to survive. Therefore, next year, uh, the drones are out mating with the queens. Therefore, they're, they're, they're reducing the... Um, uh, um, uh, reducing the sort of stability of the um uh, uh of the overall population i'm i'm not if you're in an area um where it's very cold you've got a cold winds or something like that uh then yes i'd say um put some um, uh, put insulation in 
Um, now I'm saying that from the comfort of West Sussex, um, but I haven't insulated uh, bees for over 50 years. I mean, I hear that bees don't die of cold, they die of wet and starvation. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't see any doubt about that. Okay. Um, I mean, they're still coming thick and fast, I can't keep up with them. Uh, thanks to people suggesting answers to what to do with the progressive colonies. Um, just one final one then. <laughs> Roger, do you sell queens? Um, <clears throat> I did a long time ago. I've given quite a lot away this year. Um, uh, no, I don't sell queens. And um, I've had this discussion with Carl in the last week. Um, if I'm sitting in front of a screen or an audience um, and uh, telling people that perhaps they can requeen their colonies, I don't think I should be the person that's, that's selling the queen. Um, uh, it's, it, it, it's just not me that seems uh, not dishonest, but it doesn't seem the right thing to do. So, no, I don't sell queens. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Roger. Uh, you mentioned I was on that instrumental insemination course with you, and I do remember those bees in that situation. It's the first time I'd seen a bee sting uh, in a Wellington boot. I'd never seen it pierce rubber before. Yeah, so, yes, I, I've actually got a photograph of his, his Wellington boots <laughs> and um, uh, there's about 30, 30 stings in Wellington boots. Yeah, you, you they were seen a very abs- small picture of me in the background running away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, they, that, that wasn't an isolated incident, you know. Uh, no, no. You know, uh, it's all very well saying, oh, yeah, have this, this, these bees or those bees. It could be affecting somebody else. Uh, very much so. Okay, well, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much, Roger. Thank you very much, um, yeah. Everybody, <laughs> thank you so much for asking the questions. I've been taking uh, a note of all of them on, all the way through, so we won't be losing them. Uh, we've got a panel discussion on the 17th of November where all the speakers will be coming back for that one. So if you keep questions coming through, that's fine. Uh, a nice simple address is chair at biver.com and I, I can make sure that gets there. But yes, thank you, Roger, and I uh, hope to see you all next week for the next one. Okay. Good night. I'll, I'll go and have a beer now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or two. It's past everybody's bedtime. I think, yeah, it's closing time now, Roger. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, I, thanks, I, everybody. I hope they all change their clocks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs>